<laughs> I love that. This is Kirk County, absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming this evening, and in particular for our candidates for joining us. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Laura Kraska Cooper. I am a 25-year resident of Prineville, which makes me almost not a newcomer. If you would like to ask a question of the candidates right now, you do need a ticket, and we've got a few more tickets, so if you don't have one and would like one, raise your hand, and someone will come around and give you a ticket. Okay, um, so uh, I will be drawing tickets um, and reading numbers. If your number's called, please stand or raise your hand if you're unable to stand, but also raise your hand, but stand if you can. And then someone will bring you, it's gonna be Rachel, she'll be bringing you the microphone so that you can be heard. And that's important for a reason that I'll explain in a minute. Um, we, want all, we also want all of the candidates and all of your fellow audience members to be able to hear you. So please try to avoid asking a question that's already been asked. So you might consider having a second question ready in case your question gets asked before your number is chosen. We'd like to have as many folks as possible participate, so please try to limit yourself to one question and please try to avoid multi-part questions. If we get to the end and we have a little bit more time, we will offer an opportunity for folks who asked a question to follow up if they believe their question was not answered sufficiently. If you're really tempted to spend your question time providing a detailed opinion on a particular issue, please resist. And instead, consider running for office because we always need more good candidates. <laughs> Please note, this is a nonpartisan event. It's an opportunity to hear from all the candidates in their own words, regardless of the party. However, this event would not happen if someone were not willing to put in the time and the money to host and organize it. So would you please join me in thanking the Crook County Democrats for their hard work and time in making this possible. Also, um, Central Oregon, or Connect Central Oregon, has graciously agreed to record this event, and then they're going to post a video online, social media, and that will allow people who aren't able to make it here tonight to be able to watch it. So let your friends know. Uh, and we, in particular, would like to thank Scott Breeze, if we could get a hand for him. He's, being, he's our volunteer videographer and making this service possible. <laughs> When you ask a question, because we have several positions that these folks are running for, please specify which position you are addressing your question to. So note, I'm going to read all of these names relatively quickly for you, but please note, when I list the two names for commissioner, I am doing it alphabetically. There's no priority here. So our US House of Representatives candidate is Dan Ruby. Our Oregon State, Oregon State Senator candidate is Mike McLean. Our Oregon State House of Representative candidate is Brian Samp. Our county commissioner candidates are Ken Falgren and Seth Crawford. And our county sheriff candidate is our current county sheriff, John Gottney. You may notice that there are two candidates running for one or another of these positions who are not here. Both Cliff Bentz and Vicki Breeze Iverson were offered the opportunity to be here, but neither of them have responded to the invite. So they did get an opportunity. Uh, okay, it'd be help if I had more light, but that's my old eyes. Uh, I wanna explain how the process is gonna go. So, each candidate will have three minutes to introduce themselves and to provide an opening statement. Then there'll be 90 seconds for them to answer each question. And then they will each have 60 seconds for a closing statement. Now, if a candidate is personally attacked, and we very much hope that's not gonna happen tonight, they will be given 90 seconds to respond and defend themselves. Now, the questions, as I mentioned earlier, need to be directed to a specific position, unless you have one of those questions that applies to everyone. So when you ask your question, please identify which position the question is directed to. And when we have questions for the commissioner's candidates, you should know that we're going to alternate who goes first so that each of them will take turns as to who answers a particular question first. So whoever introduces themselves first, which will be Seth because of where they're seated, um, then Ken will answer the first commissioner question first. So um, please note that our timekeepers, uh, Carol Dallas and Steve Miller, they are, you, you guys just raise your hands. They're in the front. They've got the neon ball cap, so no one can say they didn't 
yeah. <laughs> and when when a candidate is running out of time or is out of time, Steve's going to wave the pool noodle, and it's a bright color, so I don't think anybody's not going to see it. So please save your applause for all of this until the very end of the whole program, because that'll save some time on that. Um, also, we want everybody to be able to hear all the questions and answers. And second, because civil, being civil is absolutely who we are in Crick County. All right, so we anticipate going until somewhere between 7.30 and 8. So just want to let you know, depends on how many questions we have and how, how uh, quickly we, the candidates get through them. So with that, I am going to start by asking each of the candidates to give their three-minute introduction and um, opening. So we will start with Sheriff John Cotney. Well, thank you. Can you guys hear me in the back? Good. Well, as sheriff, uh, you know that we talk a lot, so in order to stay within my three-minute time limit, I wrote down my introduction so I can make sure I covered the things that I want to cover. So I wanted to say good evening to each of you and to thank you for your interest in, in your community. My name is John Gottney. I am your sheriff for Crook County. Uh, my, my law enforcement career has spanned 39 years and has been very rewarding but none more so than what I've done right here in Crook County. I began my career in 1985 and spent nine and a half years here in the Sheriff's Office. Due to the budget challenges in the early 90s, I had to seek more stability for my family, and so I joined the Bend Police Department in 1994. Over the next 16 and a half years, I held various positions from officer to lieutenant of patrol, and lastly as lieutenant of the code drug enforcement team uh, taking care of drug investigations throughout the Tri-County area. In 2007, while I was serving as patrol lieutenant, I had the privilege of attending the prestigious 10-week FBI National Academy at the Marine Corps base in Quantico, Virginia. In 2010, Sheriff-elect Jim Hensley invited me to return to Crook County as his undersheriff, a role that I began on January 3rd, 2011. Following Sheriff Hensley's retirement, I was appointed sheriff and have run opposed, unopposed in the subsequent elections, including this one. I attended the 115th National Sheriff's Institute in Aurora, Colorado in 2018, and I hold the Law Enforcement Executive Certificate from the Oregon Department of Public Safety Standards and Training. As a proud United States military veteran, I am grateful to my wonderful wife, Audrey, who has been my rock throughout my law enforcement career. Together, we have four grown children and nine grandchildren. I'm an active member of the Western State Sheriff's Association, representing Oregon among 18 states west of the Mississippi, and I serve on the Public Lands and Government Affairs Committee of that association. And for the past three years, I have served on the executive board of the Oregon State Sheriff's Association, currently as president, representing all 36 sheriffs. Additionally, I'm a member of the advisory board for the Oregon Executive Development Institute. My staff and I have achieved several significant accomplishments since my return to the Sheriff's Office. We have launched the Sheriff's Citizens Academy with over 200 participants across nine sessions since 2012. With community support, we opened the new jail in 2019, ensuring our taxpayer dollars remain in our county and that offenders are held accountable. We have hired a dedicated and professional staff and our command team has developed exceptional leadership. We upgraded our patrol fleet and our jail vehicles. Our jail remained open and operational during COVID without an outbreak and we updated our, in, and implemented our strategic plan guiding our future to the Sheriff's Office. Thank you for your continued support and I look forward to working together to strengthen our community. Good evening. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Brian Samp. I am running for Oregon House District 59. Um, I entered this race with a goal to make a difference. I love our community. I've been here since 2015, so kind of a newcomer, but I've been in Oregon since 2005. I love our state, all of our state. Um, I have a personal goal to enjoy what I do in life. I get asked, how long are you going to be doing this? And basically, that's my, my answer. 
when it stops being fun. I know a few people in this room can relate to that. Um, I'm a proud union electrician with IBEW Local 280. Before I knew what I wanted to do when I grew up, I did a bunch of different things. I lived and worked in many different places. There are the experiences that I've had can make me who I am today. I'm a volunteer at heart. I am currently serving as a member of Prineville City Planning Commission. I've had 12 years of service with the Sheriff's Department search and rescue team, dive team, so more of a recovery thing. Um, I'm also a former scuba instructor and I did training for the Sheriff's Department. I was lead uh, volunteer electrician for about 12 years, building 17 homes and one solar powered bathroom for Habitat for Humanity, Heart of Oregon, and other um, organizations such as Solar for Schools. I've built homes in Mexico with an organization called Corazon. I was a Boy Scout, have backpacked and cycled, the pedal kind, um, throughout the Western States, Canada to Mexico. I taught scuba diving for almost 20 years. I mean, that's how I got involved with the Sheriff's Search and Rescue. All these things I consider fun. Um, these are the things that I, you know, I consider fun. Um, there's a lot more. Um, tonight, I just, I'm here to introduce myself and ask for your support and vote on or before November. Fifth, thank you. You gonna tell me when to start or just let it rip? All right. Um, I want to start off with a quick poll. Uh, everybody in here, raise your hand if you love Crook County and you think it's one of the greatest places in the world and you wouldn't trade it for anything. I better see more hands than that. I know people out there and how much you love Crook County. Now, we can't always agree on everything, but I think the great thing about our community is we always have that, that we live in a great place and we all love it. There's been a lot of great things going on lately. We just got a new Justice Center. I see a lot of faces uh, that were at that event. Uh, this is going to be amazing for our community. It's going to give us the ability to keep people that are uh, breaking the laws to be held to accountable for what they're doing. Uh, just recently, uh, I was able to work with uh, Meta and the high school to get a $100,000 project done for the neat repeat, which is uh, the main economic driver for our senior center. I don't know if people know that. They uh, provide about 30,000 meals here in Crook County for people that come in, but mostly for people that are homebound that are uh, not able to leave their houses, and that's really the only interaction they have uh, all all uh, year, or all all day, or all year. Uh, we've also been working with uh, the sheriff and the DAs. We were able to uh, roll back the <coughs> uh, 110, where it was uh, making all drugs illegal or drugs legal on the streets. So we were able to roll that back. We're currently working on figuring out the state regulations for that to ensure that we follow the, the rules and that we can hold people accountable. So those are the great things that are going on here. On the other side of the coin, you have a lot of outside forces trying to get into Crook County. You have the federal government, you have the state, and you have the region. At the federal level, they're trying to uh, increase the size of the federal lands here in Crook County which I think is extremely dangerous. If we look at what the way that those federal, our current federal lands are being managed, we need to make sure that they are gonna continue to manage those forests and before they want to expand it. At the state level, they're constantly working to take away uh, our gun rights. Like I said, uh, they're making drugs legal and making it more and more difficult for us to hold people that are living on the streets accountable. When you look at uh, the region in Deschutes County, you have a lot of different 
people that are pushing agendas to not want to hold people accountable for their actions. And so we need what we need right now is a strong leader to stand up against those outside forces and protect our way of life. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see such a good crowd. And thank you, Democrats, for putting this on. I won't be quite as lengthy. <laughs> Uh, these are exciting times and so many positive changes. Oh, there we go. These are exciting times with so many positive changes going on in our county. Moving from one form of government to uh, three full-time commissioners and an administrator is the best way to oversee modern, our modern county. I know I can be an asset to the team. I enjoy projects. I see the need for leadership change, business background, and prior government experience has made me the best choice for the job. I feel strongly that we need to change in this position. My competitor does not have the focus to do this job. I just wanted to thank everybody for being here again. Um, I think some of you know, all of you, that uh, we've been here most of our lives and raised our families, uh, businesses in town. We really do stay in this county and we work hard for it. I'm glad to be a part of it and I'm really glad you're all here tonight. Good evening, I'm Mike McLean. I'm running for the state senate. I want to thank the Crick County Democrats for putting this on and Priscilla for facilitating. For those of you who celebrate Rosh Hashanah, uh, Happy New Year, that begins in one minute. <laughs> it's the Feast of Trumpets, and to those who celebrate the feats, Baruch Ata Adonai. Uh, I have been in Crook County for uh, 22 years. I grew up in Condon, and I raised my fam uh, family here <clears throat> with my um, wife, Holly, and our three kids are, are now, we're empty nesters, and uh, we're in that blissful stage where they're post-college but we're not grandparents and uh, I'm looking forward to being a grandfather so my children are tired of me hearing about it I'm sure I ran because I have a sense of urgency about three things first the rule of law I don't like cancel culture and I don't like selective prosecution I don't like targeting political opponents. I don't like, frankly, suppression of free speech. And I saw a lot of that, as many of you did. We watched everything from January 6th to the social justice riots where people wouldn't abide by the rule of law. And I'm very concerned about that. If you're a Democrat in a red state or a Republican in a blue state, because of your political views, you should never have to suffer uh, termination of your employment, targeting by the government, uh, attacks on your donors if you choose to run for political office. And I'm very concerned about the rule of law. We are a republic, and we are governed by the rule of law. And second of all, food security, both on the production side and the consumption side. I'm very concerned about the fact that we have too many families that are tight because of inflation and uh, economic instability. And we need to have a robust effort to make sure that access to food security uh, is maintained. I'm concerned, thirdly, about the budget. The federal government's budget reckoning will take place this decade. I don't know when, but it will. And that will have cascading effects on all of us. I go to Salem to advocate for those of us who live east of the mountains to make sure our services, our medical care, and the important infrastructure that we rely on is maintained. Thank you. I'm Dan Ruby. Uh, I'm a science educator from Southern Oregon, and I am running for U.S. House of Representatives in our very large congressional district. 
I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got here. I started my career teaching kids about space, elementary school kids, and that moved into working with high school kids through career and technical education, helping them plug into where they thrive, which is either university or two-year college or apprenticeships. And then I got recruited to be the CEO of a science museum, and we got funding to do a national exhibit on climate change. And how we experience that in Oregon is through our waters and our forests. And one of the components of that is wildfires that are increasingly severe. And in September of 2020, that became very real for me when the Alameda fire started in Ashland and swept through Talent and Phoenix and destroyed 2,500 homes overnight. At that point, just talking about something didn't feel like enough to me anymore. I had to do something. And so I shifted my career into working for a fire rebuilding nonprofit. And that turned into working for a federally qualified health center on transitional housing with health and human services for fire survivors. And I learned a couple things from that. One is that half the households in our district are struggling. Our families are employed, they're working hard, but they're not able to make ends meet. They're spending more than a third of their income on housing. They're spending 20% of their income on, on medical bills. They have no savings. They are one unforeseen circumstance away from serious trouble. That can be a kid getting sick, that can be a car breaking down, or that can be an extreme weather event. Related to that, we have some of the worst mental health in the nation. And for youth, we're dead last. That's depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and substance use. We can do better. That became very real for me in 2022 when one of my very close friends lost their oldest son to an overdose, just a few days shy of his 21st birthday. I don't want that to happen to anybody else's kid. What I did about that was run for school board because the way to prevent that is to care for kids upstream before that becomes a problem. But you can't just care for students. You have to also care for their families if you want to be effective. And if you really want to do a good job, you can't just care for families. You have to care for the, the communities they're in. So all of a sudden, you're looking at what does it take to build strong, resilient, vibrant communities. And the, the top of that list are homes we can afford, better access to mental health care, and education opportunities for our students and our, for our workers for, for our next generation industries. That's my experience. And those are the priorities that I would bring to Congress. I would work very, very, very hard to originate policies and programs to help Oregonians here at home. And thank you. I did forget one housekeeping item. Please feel free to go into the back if you wish and get snacks or drinks um, as you wish. Um, I will start now by reading a couple of numbers. Please remember to raise your hand and stand up if you're able when your number is called and someone will bring you a microphone. And I'm going to read two numbers so that the second person will be ready. So the first one is 617-3301. And the second one is 617-3280. The question is, where is the gift basket? <laughs> That's correct. Right. And, and this one will go to Ken first, and then Seth will respond. Okay, great. Um, so my question is campaign finance. I've got the uh, latest Forbes article that says that the uh, campaign finance for Oregon is So is your question how much has come in for their individual candidacy? Okay, so the question is for each of the two commissioner candidates to please tell us if they know how much they have received in contributions and how much of it has come from out of the county versus in the county. And we will start with Ken on this one. Well, we've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of local folks who have donated to this campaign and some great family members have helped me with little persuasion. But it looks to be about $35,000 we have spent through this campaign, or we will be spending. And 
the percentage, I'm guessing, is 90% local money. Uh, probably 90 or more. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the exact numbers. Um, I would say probably I've raised about 80000 so far. Uh, pretty similar to what I've done in the past. Uh, like I do everything I do, I uh, push it and make sure that I'm working extremely hard to the fullest. Percentages, I would say, I, I don't know. I've, I've definitely got some donors from outside the community. And uh, what I talk to them about is how great things are going in Crook County. And uh, they really appreciate what we're doing here and what uh, it means for the future of Central Oregon. So. Uh, I've got quite a few smaller donations from uh, from local. I don't know the specifics on that, but uh, does that answer your question, Gary? Like uh, like last time, did you consider every mo uh, uh, under a hundred dollar donation out of the county, like you did in that article a couple years back? Um, I don't think that's oh, okay. Okay, I don't. I don't think we need to have back and forth at this point. But Seth, is there anything else you wanted to say? Okay, all right. So that brings us to the next. Was that uh, three three zero one? Okay, so then we have three two eight zero. Do we have that person here? Uh, right there. And while we're waiting, the next one will be So the question is, what experience that you've had besides excluding your political activity has shaped your perspective and your, your approach to the growth that Crook County is experiencing and is likely to experience? And it is Seth's turn to go first. Yeah, uh, I think it's extremely important to be part of a community and um, being out there, having conversations with people, understanding what they want and knowing what is important to our community is something that uh, I've done for, for many, many years. Um, I, I think it's, it's extremely important, but I also think that, I mean, again, you said outside of that, but I think there's also not much you can, there's not, no job that will get you ready for, for the job that, that, we're, that I'm doing. And so the fact that I've been doing it for 12 years and understand the state, I have connections with people, uh, I was able to set up a meeting with our governor and the Eastern Oregon counties, uh, being able to do that on a quarterly basis. Those are things that, that most people are not able to, to put together. That uh, w w enabled me to be able to get a letter from her about um, some water issues we're having north of town, and uh, also just having connections with people all across our state because when you, inside Crook County, again, we're doing great. Once you leave Crook County and the outside forces, that's what our issues are. And having people across the street that you can call and have a conversation with, that's what you need to do in this position. Well, relationships are everything. And so when I was in this business, uh, again, that was when I had to, ability to speak to the folks as in the governor's office or the senators or others around us that, that would help us get through whatever the issue might be at that time. But more I lean on a lifetime of business, lifetime of being a part of this community, being a part of our churches, being a part of Rotary, being a part of a lot of things. It helps to round the real knowledge of what the community is about. 
we we all have interests that are that are uh, strengthened by our knowledge uh, through relationships. See that not ending, and uh, it's very important in all things. Our next question is um, six one seven three two seven three, and then the one after that will be six one seven three two six seven. So the question is about how to balance the preservation of the rural way of life with the growth that we've been experiencing, and if they can fit it in time, explain what they mean by the rural way of life. And we start with Ken on this one. Well, I think we all, we all wish we had what we might have had years ago in some ways. It is busy. We are growing. But honestly, uh, if we were not growing, we would be dying. We need to have growth. We need to have new businesses, and we need to have those, those jobs for our young people. Um, the way of life is the way we all are, to be able to take our grandchildren to the park, to be able to have concerts in the park, to be able to go to the fairgrounds and support those kids. That's the way of life we do not want to lose. We have wonderful people in this community, and we should be able to support them in that same way. I was so proud of the fair and the group and the 4-H this year as being almost, well, there were 500 kids that had been in our 4-H programs. That's more than Deschutes County, 10 times our size. That's the way of life. You know, by helping each other, by, by just waving as you go by, that's a way of life as well. We're all friendly in this town, and that's what it really means to me. I don't believe we're going to lose that. If we're careful with the way we manage our growth, with, with the way we uh, try to make things safer for our highways and for what traffic looks like out there for us, and to be patient with each other, I think that way of life will continue for us. Yeah, I talk a lot about this when it comes to uh, Crook County values, and uh, I believe that that entails a place where people are proud to grow up, proud to raise a family. I believe that guns are tools, not something that should be taken away. And, you know, like you have in uh, Portland or different places where they're used to hold up different restaurants or, or cause crimes, we're in a community where there's something that people use on a day-to-day -day basis to do their jobs and in their livelihood. I think uh, keeping our streets clean and drug free. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about working with the sheriff's and DA's office to uh, stop 110 and put us in a position where we're able to hold drug addicts uh, accountable again. I don't know if you guys know, but when 110 passed, that put our deputies in a position where they were having to give the drugs back to these criminals after they busted them and not be able to hold them accountable. That is something that I can't imagine as a non-law enforcement agent, but when you do all that work and you put all that time into trying to keep our streets safe and you're forced by the state of Oregon to hand them those drugs back, that is not acceptable. And so those are the things that I think we need to continue with. Every community is gonna grow, right? We need to do it responsibly. And is that like a 30 second or is that just done? Okay, thank you. I would like to commend the candidates for sticking to their time. I know it's not always easy, so thank you. The next, next one is 617-3267, and then the one after that will be 617-3290.
The question is, is, what is there a question for commissioners or just for me? It seems like this is kind of deteriorating. So the question is, what do the two candidates for commissioner believe is the appropriate salary for a commissioner in Crook County? And I believe this is Seth first. So that's set by a group of citizens called the Compensation Committee. Um, we as elected officials don't have any say in what that is. So um, they've set that. Um, the new salary of the position moving forward after this year um, I think it's ch it's changed. I don't have the specific numbers, but I'm happy to sit down with you and show you what the the compensation committee decided. Yeah. Well, when we were when I was a commissioner in, from 2009 through 16, I was a part time commissioner, and so was Seth at that time. And then he became the judge full time. I was uh, I started out at 33,000 as well as. Seth probably, and then I uh, made 37000 I think today, for a full-time commissioner, and I don't understand the compensation committees, the, the way they looked at it, because they, they would have had to look at every commissioner in this county, in this state, every 36 counties, and they would have had to look a little bit closer at population in that county. Uh, we are 27, 8,000 people, I think, now, um, comparable to Tillamook County or maybe Jefferson County, there's, there's four or five of them, probably close. And probably a full-time would have been paid more in the 80,000 range and no, no, no more than 100. Today, I'm, I'm just surprised how high we're, we're paying the commissioners. We're not Multnomah County. The next question is 617-3290. And the one after that will be 617-3266. So we have 3290. If not, we'll go to 3266. Okay, please try to keep that, that's, that last line is not appropriate, so please try to keep your questions civil. The question for the, can, for the candidates for commissioner is what are they going to do to try to preserve the old courthouse? And I believe we go to Ken first this time. Well, I don't work in the courthouse yet, and I'm not sure of the budget. I've been told by those uh, working in, in what has been used up, and I know there's been an excessive cost needed for the parking area. They bought out two more houses and putting in a parking space, and so that's taken some money that probably wasn't anticipated in the beginning. But uh, honestly, I don't know the answer to it, and I hope Seth has one. Yeah, so there's about $6 million left in there. Um, the additional parking areas, we were able to work with the state, and they are going to cover that. Uh, through the uh, funding that myself and Mike McLean were able to get for the courthouse uh, quite a few years back. Um, I, I'd like there to be more, and I think there's interesting ways to find other dollars and, and get that going because that's the original goal and the goal that I still am passionate about. If you were at the um, grand opening recently, it was made clear that we're going to continue with that project and make sure that the courthouse is here for another 150 years. So, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. 
I think uh, if you have sp more specific questions, I know uh, Brian Barney has been uh, really writing the lead on that. And so uh, he and I'm happy if, if you can't get a hold of him, I'm happy to dig in deeper and give you more specifics if you'd like them. The next question is from number 617-3302. And please be prepared, the holder of the 617-3296. So do we have 3302? Not seeing it. How about 3296? No? All right, then we are going to go to The question is about access uh, to Juniper um, Canyon and what the commissioner candidates would do about providing a second access for fire and, and general congestion. And I believe Seth is the one that will answer this one first. Uh, thank you so much for asking. So this spring, we had a conversation with uh, people in Powell Butte and people in Juniper Canyon. We collected some data. We're working with a transportation group and they are currently tabulating that data and in October 29th in Powell Butte that we're going to have a meeting from 6 to 8 p.m. and have specific they don't have the access to they have the uh, more of a safety issue up there when it comes to Juniper Canyon we'll be meeting at the Juniper Canyon fire hall on the 30th and I'm very, very excited to say that we will have a minimum of three specific solutions to the lack of, to the lack of secondary access with engineering and funding. And that's something we've never had before. In the past, we've had ideas of, you know, we want this road, we generally want it in this area. Uh, and this is something that I've been pushing for for, for quite a while. And I am very excited to announce, if you're interested, be at the Juniper Canyon Fire Hall on October 30th for the Juniper Canyon, on the 29th at the Community Center in Powell Butte, and we will have specific solutions to those problems. What time? 6 to 8 p.m. Well, that's great news. We've been, I don't know how many years, talking about it and having not as, not as, uh, good of an outcome. We, we actually have the, uh, the, the unimproved road on the BLM off to 380, which would be a safety, but that road is in such bad shape, it would take, uh, it would take quite a bit of money to just make that uh, really habitable for us, and even in the, in the summertime. In the wintertime, it's closed, so it's not, it's a bit of a, not the best access. Um, it's good to hear this. It's really nice to see something. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. All right, our next question is 617. Oh. <laughs> our, our next one, you know what, I'll tell you what, yes, I'll do that. How about I'm gonna exercise the moderator's um, privilege that I just made up right now on the spot. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask each of the candidates, not for commissioner, to tell us what is the issue that they think that they will most face if elected in this next election. So we'll start with Sheriff Gottney. I'm sorry, I was looking at Actually, I apologize. We should probably start at the other end. For that one? Oh. Your microphone or mine? Okay. I, I actually apologize, Sheriff. I'm going to go to the other end since we want to alternate and not put everyone on the spot first. So I'm going to give you my microphone and then I'm going to take the other microphone and change the batteries. Or gentlemen too. Thank you. 
So the issue that I would like to face most would be addressing housing. Uh, it's a it's a huge issue nationally, and what that looks like for rural Oregon is much different than what it looks like for Portland or for anywhere else in the country. What I actually expect the issue that I would be addressing is divisiveness in politics. Regardless of how the presidential election turns out, we are going to be a divided, divided nation. And we don't get anything done in rural Oregon if you don't work with your neighbor at the end of the, who has a different sign at the end of their, at the end of their driveway. So I think repairing that and remembering that we have shared values, we have a shared vision for safe, prosperous communities, we have different ideas of how to get there, but that we are not going to get anything, the past four years we've seen very little done because folks like to vote against the other party. That's not the way we're going to move forward. So I, I, I would say that it would be a super, super effort of mine to work with folks, regardless of their political party, to make sure that we address the issues that are facing us. Well, I'm running for the state senate, and if elected, the issues we're going to face are going to be uh, wide-ranging. One issue that I think is dominant that I mentioned earlier was the budget competition that takes place in Salem. I spent five terms in the House, and I served on the budget committee all five of those terms. I was in Salem during the Great Recession. I think many of you here uh, may have voted for me back then. We had to cut budgets. It's a very different mood in Salem. It's a competition. Every budget category has a lobby and has a constituency. I'm not saying that I hope that happens. I hope it doesn't. But I believe there will be a budget reckoning at the federal level, and that will cascade down to the state. We're now at $36 trillion of debt. No end in sight. How many here think that's a moral issue? If it's not a moral issue at 36, how about 40 trillion? How about 50 trillion? How about 60 trillion? When do you stand up in righteous indignation and say stop? It's the greatest generational theft humanity has ever seen. And we need to do something about it. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna give the commissioners candidates a, a break on this one. <laughs> Hi again. Um, my thing is is water rights, water availability. Um, just because you have a piece of property doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want with it when it comes to your neighbor and the outcome of your use on your neighbor's water property. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more thought as far as when somebody gives the green light to put a gravel mill, DEQ, just put a halt on the gravel mill here, and we know what's going on with the water issues there. Um, that's a start. It shouldn't have gotten that far to begin with. Um, there's other sites around the state, around the country, that we're cleaning up decades later, and the cost is more and more and more, and people's lives are impacted by that. So let's start now, work it out so that it doesn't happen going forward. Thank you. How about now? Oh, now we're on. Okay. Couldn't hear myself. I thought something was wrong here. Sometimes too. <laughs> uh, anyway, the one thing that 
I see it as a problem for this community and going forward is a problem for every community, and that's public safety. And I say that because for the last many years uh, since I've been sheriff and even prior to being sheriff, while I was under sheriff and Sheriff Hensley was sheriff, each year we struggle to make sure How about now? Okay, good. Anyway, we've, we struggle for every year to make sure that we had a budget that I could keep deputies on the road responding to calls and being out there when you call for help, responding to motor, motor crashes, things like this. And that every year has continued to grow. So in this my, my next term, one of the main priorities for me and my staff is that we have some form of stable funding for your sheriff's office so that we can continue to provide the services that you demand and that you deserve. And it's my, my vision of how this is gonna work is the first thing we would need to do is form a citizen's blue ribbon committee to look at the needs of the sheriff's office and where it's going in the future. And this is a very pressing issue for us um, and we need to move forward on that and I look forward to working with many of you on that. Okay, now we'll go back to questions from the audience. The next number is 617-3269. And the one after that will be last four numbers, 3263. So if you have 3269, please raise your hand. My wife gave me her shit. <laughs> So the question. So the question notes that both of the candidates for commissioner have served um, either now or before, and the question is, what original idea have they brought to that their service at the Crook County Commission that has benefited the county? And we will start with Ken. Profited in counties, uh, we're not to be a profit center but that yeah well so something I did back in about 2010 probably was look into solar being added to our buildings and it took a year or so to uh, to really understand it because it was fairly new for us and by the time it was finished within another year uh, we did benefit by the uh, energy trust uh, there were we put solar panels on 16 buildings, both the county and the city. So and that was beneficial because they gave us seven cents per kilowatt towards the, the county. And we did not pay anything for those panels. We just agreed to put them on our buildings. So for the first 15 years, we made a profit. It helped to pay for our electric bills. And then going forward, it's still paying the electric bills on these buildings. So that was one project. So, just so I understand, so the $16 million that Mike and I got for the Justice Center, that's not what you're talking about. It would be something separate than that? I don't know. I mean, you said, because there's other counties that have gotten original ideas, so the $16 million probably wouldn't count. So, I would say I was able to negotiate to get the naming rights for the indoor arena for $250,000 from uh, Pape, uh, which could not have come at a greater time. Uh, that was, there was a lot of, you know, they look great, but there was internal issues with the, the, indoor, uh, the outdoor arena that needed to be fixed, and luckily it was right around a $250,000 price tag. So we were able to do that. We were able to parlay that money with uh, volunteer time to uh, re, re uh, sand and refurnish, re varnish all of the uh, benches in there and really bring that back to its former glory, as well as adding speakers and lights. 
I don't know if you've been to the rodeo lately in the, in the evening, you know, when it gets kind of, uh, you get the bull riding and you get the lights flashing and the, the music playing. That's all specifically from that. And, and those are, not only is it important for our culture and our Crook County values, but it also gives uh, our ability to rent that out and for different events. Uh, it, you know, you have, you have your, your races, the rodeo, and different things, but there's also, when you have assets like that, you can continue to rent it out. Our next number is 3263, and then please be on deck, 3285. The question is for the commissioner candidates, asking them what they have done to make the lives of veterans better. So uh, I've, I've worked with our veterans organization uh, quite a bit, uh, and I'm extremely proud to be a non, the Band of Brothers. Um, and so I, I'm very proud to be an honorary non-military member. I wanna be very clear that I did not serve but uh, last year they, they in inducted me into the Band of Brothers because of their appreciation for what I've done to, uh, for veterans here locally. Uh, I would say probably the largest thing I did was uh, three probably biggest ones, but I probably won't get all three out because of the timers. The first one is uh, the county got a bunch of money. I think it was $30,000 uh, from COIC to do a transportation money for the veterans. And I took the uh, leadership and talked with the Band of Brothers and worked with them to give them that money to buy a van. And so instead of two years, that van that's been running veterans to mili or m medical appointments has been going for, I'm gonna say 10 years, nine or 10 years. And uh, we've got great people in there. They're very vigilant about keeping it up. And so uh, there's that. Uh, I've worked with them on the flags of Primeville. Uh, for many, many years, people tried to get flags to line the streets of Primeville, and it was something that our veterans were very p passionate about. And myself and Melissa McGrew and the, uh, the guard at the top of the grade all worked together and drilled holes to be able to line those streets, and that's something that we still partner with the Band of Brothers today. And there's a couple others, but I ran out of time. Thank you for the question. Well, when I was commissioner, I worked on uh, putting a committee, a, a community committee together for the veteran service officer. So we had a monthly meeting. We brought in other uh, people who've served, people who have all, all of the uh, Navy and Marines and all of the service. And we, we would work together as a community. And then I uh, worked with the Association of Oregon Counties and was the incoming chair of that committee as well for the Association of Oregon Counties. Uh, many dollars were brought into the community. A lot of legislation was part of that at the time, but it's been a few years back. I can't name exactly which things we did, but we did receive monies for our service. The next question is 3285, and then on deck will be 3297.
the question is for Sheriff Gottney, and uh, I think in summary, the question is, how does Sheriff Gottney see the sheriff's role um, with respect to activities from the federal government when policies change and the government is actively trying to round up um, folks who are not citizens in our community, and whether Sheriff Gottney sees that as the role of the county sheriff? Well, first of all, I have to uh, kind of lay a little foundation here, is that even though I'm the elected sheriff by the citizens of the county, I'm also certified by the state of Oregon, and I have to uphold the laws of the state of Oregon. We have a ORS that's been in place since uh, 1987. It's ORS 181A820, which forbids any local law enforcement from participating with the federal agencies in regards to immigration issues. It does not, we do not have the ability even to let ICE come into our facility. Uh, we cannot notify ICE if we have someone in our facility that, that we believe is an illegal person. Uh, we are forbidden from doing that. And if we, if we violate that, then we can be charged. It could actually come up to where I could actually lose my certification and not be able to be sheriff in this county. The next question is from the person who holds 3297, and the one after that will be 3264. We have 3297. Not seen it, we're gonna go to 3264. Okay, then we will move to 3268. Okay, let's try one more. Three, two, nine, five. Do we have three, two, nine, five? Ah, we do. The question is for Sheriff Gottney, and the question is, uh, well, it's an observation that we've had a fair amount of reckless driving in Kirk County, and um, what the sheriff might be able to do or what he might be planning to do about that if reelected, unopposed. If I, if I don't get reelected, we've got another problem, so. Uh, well, we started this I know back um, back last year, or maybe even the year before that. We had a town hall meeting out in Powell Butte where we met with the community and we put out numbers and, and stats and stuff. And we also up in Juniper Canyon. Those are our two main problems where we have a lot of a lot of issues, and mostly it's the commuting traffic back and forth on 126. And then the, there's a lot of people up Juniper Canyon, obviously, and and um, we have a lot of crashes up there. What we have done, uh, back during the time when we were very short-handed, um, I had to actually move some of my patrol deputies into the jail to be able to cover jail shifts because the sheriff, I'm mandated to run a jail. I have to do that, so I had to keep that going. But during that time, we got a little creative, and it was actually kind of funny because we created uh, a, a dummy car with a little dummy in it that we called Sheriff M. Anakin and put a hat on him and a badge and stuff. And actually, people were stopping along the road and doing selfies with him because they thought it was funny. <laughs> but we have, uh, since then, working with the county, providing those numbers as evidence-based uh, documentation of what the stats are. The county is growing. Our need for more uh, enforcement. Um, they came through. We were able to hire more people. We got our jail up to par, 
and then we filled up our patrol, almost filled it up. And so there's more people out there now working it, but we will continue to do that. Uh, certain areas we do target because of the number of complaints we get there. So let me ask this just in case, you know, we've, we want to um, put the others on the spot. Does anyone in particular who may, may or may not have chosen a ticket have a question for Dan, Mike, or Brian? Oh, we, we see one, one here. Just trying to break it up. <laughs> The question is for Mike and Dan, and it's an observation that um, we have some drought conditions, and what do they suggest we do, to, or what will they do to manage it? Thank you for the question. Yes, the my district is 70,000 square miles, the side of the state of, state of Washington, and water is a huge issue. But it looks different for each part of the district, so it's different for Southern Oregon, different for Central Oregon, different for Eastern Oregon. What I've seen work is in places like uh, along the in the Klamath Basin, we had everybody at the table. We had ranchers, we had tribal members, we had um, uh, environmentalists, we had every water user at the table for many years coming to an agreement that was imperfect but workable. These things are complex and messy. What happened was that my opponent came in with a, a federal legislation that I, I don't think will pass, but basically tanks it. It's coming in and thinking that the federal government knows better than what folks know for their own region. And so um, instead of supporting the work that had been done, it was stepping into, stepping on the toes of the folks that have been working. And so a lot of that's gonna be starting from scratch. I guess to answer your question, we're gonna have less water in the future everybody's gonna have less water. Even the senior users are gonna have less water. So we're gonna have to change how we do things. But those ideas need to come from the communities that are on those waterways and everybody needs to be at the table. And we need to have minimal, minimal interference from the federal government, except for to support us in those agreements. Thank you for your question. Just. Uh, Congressman Cliff Bentz is hosting October 8th in Redmond at the fairgrounds a subcommittee on water specifically in Central Oregon and the issues. I encourage you all to go. Uh, Congressman Bentz will be there along with uh, Congresswoman Lori chavez Dreamer and other members of the subcommittee on water. He is the chair of the subcommittee. And so he has a lot of authority. Um, and you can learn more about federal uh, regulatory issues there. From the state level, I'm running for the state Senate. Water, in the absence of legislation, is governed by the executive branch, specifically the Water Resources Department. So when I go to Salem, I won't be doing a whole lot. I have an opportunity to introduce legislation. And the legislation uh, that I'm currently contemplating does not address uh, the water issues. It does, however, I, I have certainly understood that the Western water law and the time in first in time, first and right, may not be working for us during an environment of increased climate change and increased population. So we may have to have some sort of adjustment to reward people for sharing and re rather than overusing. The next question will come from 3288, and then the one after that will be 3271. Do we have 3288 three, here? 
I believe we do. Can you can you speak closer to the microphone or I should tell you all that um, the, uh, the nice gentleman just pointed out that if you put your finger over the button, it will mute it. So we should all try to keep our hands below the button. Okay, let's try this. Closer. It might be muted. <clears throat> So the question is about environmental issues and, and what we can do to, um, I guess, use more renewable energy to, to be more environmentally conscious in Crook County. And I'm going to assume that was a question for everybody, or was that a question for the commissioners? or everybody. A question for everyone. Okay, let's start with Sheriff Gottney because we started at the other end last time. Do you see this look on my face? I <laughs> Uh, I, I can't address the issue of, of all of that, but I will tell you this. Uh, being on the um, Government and government Affairs and Public Lands Committee of the Western State Sheriff's Association, as well as the Oregon State Sheriff's Association, we look very hard at issues that has to do with the public lands. And if these are things that's affecting the public lands, and I know the solar panel issues have come up before. And I may not be on track with what you're asking, but I'm just going to go down this route anyway, and hopefully these guys can answer it better for you. Um, we had several things that's come up this last year with the public, uh, public land managers. Uh, BLM being one who wanted to change the rule, arbitrarily just change a rule that says they could close down any part of public lands anytime they wanted to for any amount of time with no, no set set clause. And both Western States Sheriffs, Nor uh, National Sheriffs Association and Oregon State Sheriffs Association all opposed that and wrote letters uh, to the re National Register and opposed this. By doing that, BLM backed off of it and said, okay, we maybe went a little far. We will only do this in emergency situations, and we will set a, sun cl a sunset clause when that happens, which that was a victory for, for, the, for the, uh, the country. The other part was, and we're still working on this, I guess I'll do this later. So I mentioned I was an electrician. Um, I've been on several solar projects, uh, one of which is out here by Apple, um, basically a square mile of solar panels. You can see it from your house up in Juniper Canyon, probably. Um, I've also built solar panels. You know, I mentioned it earlier, the solar panels for schools. That was a total volunteer thing. I'm a big fan of solar power. Um, whether you have a battery backup or just pumping it into the grid, um, it makes a difference on your on your your homeowner's power bill. Um, and I pushed to try to get uh, when I was doing Habitat for Humanity, um, they had a three and a half acre site that uh, I was trying to push for putting solar on each of the the homes that as they were being built because they were a public utility. Um, area, the cost versus what they were paying for electricity at the time didn't pencil out. But, you know, 10 years later, yeah, maybe it would have. So lost investment. Um, the sooner you do it, the, the, the better it is for you. Okay, uh, I'm going to go with the good, bad, and the ugly. Good? You got a biomass plant that we're working on here in Crook County. Not only will it clear out the forests of uh, uh, fuels, it'll help fight forest fires. 
I'm going to go with the bad uh, state and federal electric car requirements. If we look at trucking and the weight of these things and, and getting rid of the batteries, they're, they're not looking at that. They're looking at, at the, the today standards. And out of the, all of them, ugly. I don't know if you guys know about the 50 to 60,000 acres of solar panels that they want to put on our BLM land that they've told other people that because of uh, winter range deer and, and elk and different situations that you can't do anything on there, but now they're gonna just blanket the whole area with solar panels. Luckily, uh, the county, when uh, I got elected judge, was able to implement a natural resource policy. I'm the only uh, candidate for commissioner up here that, that supported that. And uh, that has given us the ability to coordinate with the BLM early in the process so we can talk to them about the, the loss of grazing, the loss of uh, the four-wheeling, and just the loss of our, our public lands in general. So I, I totally agree with you that where we can, we gotta work and keep the environment as strong as possible, but it's gotta make sense. Well, the only thing I saw that he was saying is that um, I guess he blames me that I, I didn't, I wasn't a part of this Natural Resources Committee and it came in after I was gone. So I didn't have a choice on that, but believe that it has done some good. Um, you know, solar is something we can probably sink our teeth in. It does seem to work pretty well. The size of some of these solar panels or the arrays have become almost heat sinks when you look at the, at the world. Um, I'm afraid that we have no way to dispose of them just like these lithium batteries, we, we were going to have to look a little farther to find better ways to handle our, our need for electricity. And as science changes and these panels get better and we find other ways, I know that it will happen. Our batteries are getting better, all those things. But today it's hard. It's hard for us to watch a way for, uh, for our kids to end up having to dispose of them. So I would be in favor of any other source of, of power. I know that today we're going to have to have uh, oil and gas. We're going to need that as well, and it's still a combination. I see us all cutting out a lot of our, our uh, need for coal. That seems to be something consistent across the nation. Agreeing with our fellow commissioner is that the biomass, the the uh, to, to be able to take some of the load off of our forest is by far the best way for us to be away from our bad air in the summertime, these, these high problems we have had with, uh, with our air, air quality. At the state level, we've had a lot of litigation, or not litigation, legislation uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, so I don't go to Salem to add more what i'd like to do is see us accomplish what's been in place and what we have are public utilities that perhaps don't want to comply and so we're going to have to have some uh, assertiveness by our state government in meeting its electric grid goals so climate legislation is one area. Another area is regulation with regards to polluters and cheaters. People who cheat in the market system pollute and danger our kids and our communities. I'm all about enforcing the law on them. But when it comes to uh, legislation, I don't have any current ideas that haven't already been addressed. Uh, my thought is if we're gonna set a state mission, then we need to focus and do it. We have robust renewable energy laws and uh, I'd like to see it being a tad easier to cite. Remember, if you're gonna have a carbon-free grid, you gotta have the ability to make it happen. Thank you. It's a it's a big question, and I want to focus on fires. We're up to nearly two million acre mega fires. That doesn't work for anybody. That doesn't work for loggers. It doesn't work for ranchers that that 
have have their livestock uh, on our lands. It doesn't work for farmers. It doesn't work for people that live in and around communities that are burning. I agree with folks across the political spectrum that our science in how we manage forest lands is out of date. We can do better with managing our public lands. We can do things like burn underbrush. We can do much better about how we replant. We can do better about thinning and how we log. We can also provide incentives for private landowners to do better and use updated, updated science. But that's only part of the thing. We are not gonna get better on wildfire if we don't also acknowledge that climate change is happening. We need to address and mitigate that. And we can't, unfortunately, do that with all, without reducing fossil fuels. I also recognize that we're in a unique position in rural Oregon. So I'm on the Rural School Board Caucus. We don't want electric bus. You can't have electric buses in rural Oregon. It doesn't work. The routes, they would run out of batteries halfway through their route. Um, you also, I just, uh, the Ford Family Foundation put out uh, Oregon by the numbers. You know how much people drive in Malheur County? Uh, on average, per person, per year, 96,000 miles. You can't do that in an electric car, and we don't have the infrastructure. We're not going to put that in in rural Oregon. We will always depend on fossil fuels. We will always need gas vehicles in rural Oregon. Thank you. Um, so I think that we just can't get around things like large solar. OK, our next uh, question will be from number 3271. And the person after that will be the person, the lucky person who holds ticket 3291. So do we have 3271? Yeah, can you repeat that? I, I, the, the, the first one, could you repeat the question? I think the first one was about what is the most, their most important personal trait? How would you describe your own personal work ethic? Oh, thank you. Okay, so the question is for the, for the commissioner candidates, how would you describe your own work ethic and what other traits are important to, become, to being a successful commissioner? Oh, I apologize. Yes, Ken is first on this one. So, my apologies. <laughs> okay, well, thanks. I don't work ethic. My wife thinks I'm a workaholic. I've always worked seven days a week, and now it looks like I need to work again. She's told me I need to go back to work. So my work ethic is pretty strong. I started working when I was 12 years old, sweeping floors in a parts store, and it's just never ended. And now here I think I'm retired, and I've just not enough to do. When I worked for the county, I was paid part-time but worked full-time, and it still wasn't enough, really, to, uh, to handle what we, were, what we were up against and how much there was for the county to be doing. You know, it was 23 departments. It just it takes everyone in the team to be able to keep up with that. My work ethic is pretty high. I have an extremely hard work ethic. Uh, I think there's people in this room that have seen me and called me uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning on a weekend to come fix the flag at the top of the grade. When you get me, you get me all the time. Uh, when it comes to uh, traits, I think one of the most important things is consistency. And what I just heard a minute ago really surprised me that Ken was t touting the fact that he put solar panels on buildings in Crook County, and then just a minute ago he was talking about how he thought solar panels were a negative uh, source of power and I'm probably gonna open myself to a 90 second rebut but it just seems that 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 doesn't track to me so you either are behind solar panels and that's an important part of the equation or they're not the right fit for our community so I think consistency is extremely important when it comes to a candidate and coming up with unique interesting ideas that are low cost and improve our county the next question is 3291, and then the person after that will be 3298. Yeah, I think there's a rebuttal in there somewhere. No, the rebuttals are personal attacks, saying that 
that I, I don't I don't think that qualifies as a personal right. attack. Did he, he slid right through. Did you hear that? All right, I'm going to defer to the audience. Go ahead, Ken. Well, I was very proud of the way we, we were able to put the 16 buildings with, with solar back at that time, and Energy Trust helped us pay for it. What we're seeing today that Energy Trust is helping, but they're not at that level, and it's, it's more expensive, and it may not be the right fit for what we're doing today. There's nothing wrong with solar. Solar seems to be as clean as anything, but it still is only good during the day. With battery backup, it's getting better, and we are getting better in, on our pricing with solar panels. We will always expand them, but as Seth said, having the BLM uh, expect us to have 30,000, 40, 50,000 acres of BLM land covered with solar panels is just not the answer. That's taking a land away from you and I who own that land. Okay, we're going to go to 3291. And then the next one will be 3298. Do we have 3291 here? I don't see it, so we'll go to 3298. So the question is for all of the candidates except poor Sheriff Gottney. And the question is about what other sources of energy do you see in the future that will be beneficial to us and our children and grandchildren? Thank you. So uh, when we talk batteries, we aren't necessarily talking the kind of batteries that you think of but scaled up. Um, there, there's such thing as, as water batteries. You can have uh, water that's, that's pumped up during the day and then flows down to turn turbines at night when solar is not working. So um, we're looking at, at forward thinking next generation stuff. Uh, so wind, solar, and water are going to be the ways that we get there. And it's going to look different for each community. I would really love to see a move toward more municipal scale and more um, uh, public owned uh, uh, community, community scale stuff that fits each community. And then uh, there's some there are some county commissioners in Umatilla that are really fascinated with uh, called uh, small module reactors, so next generation nuclear. What I have to say, it doesn't exist yet. It does not exist yet. When people talk about nuclear, we're talking about nuclear that's decades old. I'm not interested in that, but um, but that's not to say that in the future there won't be smarter, better, smaller, cleaner, safer nuclear power. So. Um, I think a, a mix of those things. I don't really have anything unique to add. I think he articulated the fact that it's going to take a plethora of options and we should be innovative and not limited necessarily to what we understand science to be now, but know that the problems that need to be solved can get solved. Uh, we put a human on the moon, for God's sakes. Uh, the projects that were the Manhattan Project, there were all these things that we set as national objectives. We need to set this. We don't have enough energy protected for the future to feed artificial intelligent operated type systems. Energy is going to dictate the next century of whose predominant political system uh, prevails and we need to have national objectives focused on this and then align it as best we can with our best and brightest from our state very good the things we've done locally and and tried to promote here they're based on a power purchase agreement so we have companies locally large companies that use a lot of power so 
as commissioners, we've really reached out and tried to find ways for them to be able to buy that power from us if we were to generate that power. The Bowman Dam was one of those projects, and it was sad to see that it, it didn't produce enough power, two to five kilowatts, and that just didn't, that, or excuse me, megawatts, and it wasn't enough to get their attention. So that's still available to us. The cost is there. Um, the other would be this new cogen plant uh, to help clean our forests. It's been in process and conversation for over 10 years. The city's taken the lead on what is going on at this time. Eric Klon, engineer with the city, is working full-time on it, and then, well, over part-time, and then part-time with the city to bring that forward. I believe that it probably will have a power purchase agreement. It will have, as much as my understanding, 20 megawatts of power, which is enough for their attention, and it's local. So that should help us in three or four ways, mostly cleaning the air, keeping our forests thinned, keeping people at work in the forest. There really is no downside to this one. It's just the size. Is it, is it big enough to make a difference for us here in this, this community? So uh, I actually went back to Washington, D.C. with uh, Eric Klon and the mayor of Primeville at the time, Steve Offelman, and uh, we were actually able to bring back a million dollars for uh, the, the project from the Forest Service uh, because it is extremely important that we start finding ways to just get rid of these fuels that are in our forests that are burning. Uh, not only are they costing billions of dollars of our federal budget when we could be actually cutting trees and making money, but they are also uh, pumping smoke into our communities, hurting people that I have a good friend that has uh, lung issues. He's not able to go outside in the when those days come, he's stuck inside in oxygen uh, where it kills people that want to come over here and visit our communities. There, there's just so many negative things about these fires, and this would be a really good project. And one of the things that wa the people in Washington, D.C. really enjoyed about it was uh, the fact that it's repeatable. So if we can get this done here, we can go to Wyoming. We can go to uh, different places all over the West that have large swaths of public land and put, put these projects in these areas, again, not only improving the economy, but improving the livability of those communities and getting fuels off the forest. There's all kinds of technology out there. Wind, um, people don't like the big windmills, you know, obstructing their, their view. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with, um, we've talked about putting these things out in the ocean. Um, again, uh, eyesores, um, there's uh, wave generating uh, buoys that generate electricity because of wave action. Um, again, I'm still a big fan of solar. If you put a solar panel array on top of every house in this county, you imagine what kind of power you generate. Um, so. The biomass thing is is a, a move forward within our county. Um, I would say that we need to figure out what to do with the mass that isn't burnt. You know, where does it go? We don't want to add a, another source of pollution. You know, just by you know it running off, we need to take care of that byproduct as well. Well, I'm not going to be left out. <laughs> I may not be the smartest person uh, in regards to green energy and solar panels and stuff like that. Obviously, these folks up here are way more educated on that than I am. That's not my expertise in life. But I got to tell you, uh, in the recent year, last year, it was suggested to us that it would be a good idea for us to buy electric sheriff's cars. Now, 
I'm not, like I said, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but the last time I looked, the county was 3,000 square miles, and it's 83 miles to the southeast corner of our county. The last time I was out there, there was no electric charging stations. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the consensus of the informal judges is that we should give Seth 90 seconds to respond to the attack that he had at the beginning, that he, the allegation that he lacks focus. So go ahead, Seth. We want to make sure everybody has a chance. I can't even remember I'm th that unfocused. <laughs> Can somebody remind me? I'm just kind of floating around up here. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I've just, I was just joking. I, if you, I'm good. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I've been pretty clear about being focused uh, with my answers and giving specifics, maybe things that people don't agree with, but... Um, all the answers I give uh, are not generalities. They're, they're specifics that uh, I'm working on, have worked on, or have completed. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, our next one, which will be the last question of the night. So, who holds lucky three, two, nine, four? Ah, down here. The, the question was what positions were they were running for, and so just to remind you that Mike McLean is running for Oregon State Senator, and that um, Brian is running for the Oregon State House of Representatives. I believe there was just a personal attack of jaywalking. <laughs> So the question is about the mine that um, may or may not be impacting the quality of water. I'm just saying that because I don't have any evidence, but, but there have been claims and there's, there's a problem with water, let's put it that way. And um, there are a number of folks who have said that it is the mine. And, and uh, so the question is, how are the two commissioner candidates looking at this and what would they do um, in the next term about that issue? Oh, and we will start with Seth. So uh, we, we had a really good conversation today at our court meeting. I wish you could have been there, Ken. Uh, the, uh, the, the problem is we haven't had a specific thing that we could bring to the state and say, this isn't working. This is a problem. There, there's been no data that they've given us. And, and I, I kind of feel like a, a broken record saying this. Uh, Bill Zelinka could back me up on this. We don't have... A, uh, he's back there in the back. If you don't, if you didn't see him, uh, we don't have scientist fact or part of the county. That's all state issues. But I can tell you that Susie and I have been just hammering away at the state. We uh, we got a letter from the governor. We recently got a letter from the state saying um, that they are concerned and want to. I don't remember the exact wording, but say we we need to think about delaying this. So I think that's a really good step. And again, we had a great conversation today about some specifics that we can go to the state, or at least our attorneys, and say, are these the kind of things that we can slow this process down? Because I think it's super important that we find out what the issues are, not play a blame game, right? We can sit here and blame all these different things. Until we have data that says what it is or isn't, then, then it makes it extremely hard 
for us to move forward as a community, as citizens, and say, this is what's happening. This needs to be fixed. And, and that's DEQ, right? Our state uh, is got the D Department of Economic Quality, and they need to be taking care of these citizens. So the DEQ uh, have been working with you now, and that's good to see, but it's sure been a slow run to get any of their attention. You know, I, I wonder, is there a way to filter this water and then have our state or others help us pay for it? Is that even possible for this chemical? It, it's gotten into so much of your water, and now, what, 35 locations have been, have been uh, given even more trouble with it. But it's a response that worries me. Are we finally feeling like we're getting a little response? Right. Well, we couldn't just filter it, but if, if we stop it, is it in the groundwater for centuries? Is it in there now and nothing more we can do, or can we do more? Well, we've at least stopped it or slowed it down right now. That's what I've read, and that's a that's a positive direction. Finally, they've gotten this slowed down. So. Well, they're asking for organic. They have to use pesticides. Stop the next. No. So the discussion is about um, whether the project or whether the mining there might expand which um, the concern is that that could worsen the problem. And so there's two issues they're talking about, uh, addressing any issue that, any water quality issues that have arisen now, and also any that might occur in the future from any expansion. Part of the problem too, they had an unlined pond. And so that, that now has gone back into the soil as well. Yeah, I don't, I've, yeah, well, you're next to the dust they put in the hills there next to you and the trees and all of it. But Okay, I think that we are now at the end. And so before we have them do a closing statement, I would love if everybody could please give them a round of applause because this is a, it, it's really tough to put yourself out there. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of numbers. I, I, unfortunately, I'm sorry. We had already announced this as the last question, so I... I'm very sorry that you're disappointed and not going to be able to answer your question, but I suspect that the candidates are going to stick around um, afterwards, so if you would like to ask your question of them afterward, I think that that would be perfectly appropriate. So we are now going to go to final statements, and we will start with John Gottney. Sixty seconds for a final statement. All right, thank you. So, as I said in the beginning, I've been your sheriff for almost nine years. In January, I will start my tenth year with the Crook County Sheriff's Office as your sheriff. I want to continue as your sheriff. I love this community and the people who make it who we are today. I choose to live here and to serve you. In my opinion, there is no place that I would rather live. Our kids have gone through the Crook County school system, and now our grandchildren are attending those same schools that their parents attended. We have a permanent connection to this community. Even when I worked in Bend, we lived in Powell Butte, so we have not left the county at any time. 
I have the best staff of dedicated professionals who carry on the service of this community each and every day. We have accomplished a lot over the past years, but more needs to be done. One accomplishment I would like to see is what I talked about earlier, is to form a citizens committee to look at the stable funding options for the sheriff's office to continue the law enforcement service that you demand and deserve. Working together to support public safety, we can continue to enjoy the lifestyle of the community that we have all come to love, where we can raise our families in a manner that is imperative to growth and happiness. So it is for these reasons, and all of that we have discussed tonight, that I ask you to support me and vote to continue me as your sheriff. Thank you all for coming out, Listen to all of us trying to attempt to solve the world's problems in 30 second sound bites. Um, thank you for the, to the Pine Theater for hosting this event again. I never thought I'd be get into politics, let alone run for public office. In the past two years, I have tossed my hat in the ring for library board, parks and rec board, school board, and Crook County Commissioners. I've served my executive, my local union executive board as a recording secretary elected. I'm a problem solver. I have one basic goal for myself, and so far so good, uh, to be a good human. I promise to show up, be present, be prepared, to be available to answer questions or concerns, if I don't have an answer, I'll find out. I'll not BS my way to an answer. To find out more, BrianStamp.com. Please vote November 5th, on or before 8 o'clock. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you guys changing the lighting from last time. <laughs> it was pretty rough if you were here before. Pretty bright. Uh, so, like, like the sheriff, I've been here for an extended period of time. I've been here for 12 years. Um, I think we've done some really, really great things in the county. I think we have really, really great things to come. And I want to continue to be out there fighting for you. If it's in the forest, if it's for your values, if it's against um, the region and what they're trying to do to our community, if it's for gun rights, um, all, all those different things are so important to our community that we need somebody that, are, that is there that is willing to stand up and push back when the world's trying to come in here and change us. Well, there's no question about the right candidate for Crook County Commissioner. This is a county that I love, and Primeville is a city that I love, and I have lived here since 1971. My wife has lived here since 1963, and we live here. We really live here. We went to school here. We got married here. We raised our kids, now grandkids. We bought our home. We've opened businesses here, carried, cared for our parents here. We really live here. I have watched this town. I love change. Industry has changed. Employment opportunities have changed. The ability to buy a home has changed. The county has changed, has grown, and with it, growth comes, with growth comes opportunities. Our county's leadership under the incumbent has changed as well. Under current leadership, our county has drifted. Under this leadership of someone more concerned with photo opportunities than hard work. Under the leadership of someone quick to take f credit for work done by others and the citizens of Crook County will suffer for this drifting leadership. A vote for Ken Falgren, vote for Ken Falgren, I hope I have earned your trust and your vote. Thank you. I'm running for the State Senate, District 30. I hope that you vote for me. I'm running unopposed. And as my wife says, you better get more votes than people who leave that oval blank. So if everyone in here would agree to fill it in, I'd be grateful. I'm looking forward to serving in the State Senate, not because I have a slate of answers. 
that I know will work. But I got some burning questions to ask. First, are we going to be a state that follows the rule of law, not the fury of the mob based upon partisanship? Second, are we going to step up and make sure that food security doesn't, or insecurity doesn't plague our communities? And third, we've got to engage in a budget competition. We have to be honorable, not just for our families and our communities, but our great-grandchildren. Yes, even that far, because national debt what does matter, and it's going to cascade down to the state and county and city. Thank you. I want to compare how I've spent the past four years versus how my opponent has spent the past four years. I've spent the past four years working on housing, health, and education in my community with people regardless of their political party. My opponent has spent the past four years voting against programs and projects that benefit Oregonians alongside his seatmate Marjorie Taylor Greene. I have nothing against him personally. I think he's a wonderful person. Um, but he's had one piece of legislation come out of committee and none become laws. I have 40 pieces of legislation ready to pick up and take to the finish line. I believe the job of our representative is to work hard for the folks in our district, and I pledge to do that. Thank you to all the candidates. Thank you very much to the Pine Theater. Thanks again to Scott Breeze and Connect Central Oregon for recording tonight's event. Thanks also to our timekeepers, Carol Dallas and Steve Miller. Thank you to the Crook County Democrats for sponsoring this event and taking care of all of the logistics. And a big thank you to everyone here. You've, I think, tonight proved again that this is the most engaged and informed electorate in Central Oregon. And while we sometimes disagree and occasionally get a little bit agitated, we mostly recognize that we're all neighbors and we say, pr stay pretty much respectful. So thank you for that. And I really hope you'll give yourselves a round of applause for that. <laughs> We are finished. Thank you. Thank you.